Welcome to this presentation by the Strategic Threat Assessment Group. The group examines and scrutinizes actual and potential threats to the Western Alliance and any of its members. It analyzes whether those threats are real and prioritizes those that are more serious. It has recently been asked to examine the question whether global warming constitutes a global crisis or emergency. The group has concluded that there is a grave but elementary error of physics that in fact created the imagined climate emergency. Once that error is corrected, the imagined and indeed imaginary emergency vanishes away. Now it may be that if you have watched the mainstream news media you will think there is only one side to the climate story. The group does not take sides in questions such as this. It always consults authorities on both sides as it has in preparing the present presentation. In the course of the group's researches it was discovered that, in effect, climate scientists had, at a vital point in their calculations, forgotten that the sun was shining. Accordingly, they had overstated global warming fourfold. Once that error is corrected, the amount of global warming to be expected will not be negligible, but it will be small, slow, harmless and net beneficial. This presentation will come as a surprise to some and as an annoyance to others. It is, however, designed to present in a straightforward and reasonably clear fashion the elementary point of science on which the error turns, so that anyone with a sufficiently open mind can see that indeed an error has been made it is a grave error, it is an elementary error, and upon correction of it, the climate emergency vanishes away. What then was this central error that climate scientists on both sides of the debate about global warming perpetrated? The error concerns the role of what are called feedbacks in global warming. Now the essential point to understand from the start is that the final warming or equilibrium temperature is equal to the direct warming such as the direct warming by the fact that the sun is shining or the direct warming by uh, man-made and indeed naturally occurring greenhouse gases and that direct warming is known as reference temperature. And to that you add the feedback response to the direct warming. So the direct warming itself plus the feedback response equals the final or equilibrium temperature. So what then is feedback response? Well it's an additional warming triggered by and proportional to a direct temperature. So if you have a direct temperature, whether it be from the sun or from greenhouse gases, that will trigger feedback processes in the climate which amplify the direct warming. And they do it in a way that's proportional to the size of the direct warming. So the bigger the direct warming, the bigger the feedback response. Feedback response is the difference between reference and equilibrium temperatures, between the direct warming and the final warming. The direct warming before feedback and the final warming after feedback. The difference between those two is the feedback response. So why does it arise? It arises chiefly because the atmosphere is capable of carrying more water vapour as it gets warmer. And water vapour is a greenhouse gas. Now, the notion that the, as the atmosphere warms it can hold more water vapour 
is one of the very few proven results in climatology. The question, however, is how much warming that feedback response will cause. Now, a positive feedback is one which causes a feedback response that increases reference temperature and a negative feedback attenuates the feedback response and hence uh, makes the temperature a little smaller than it was to start with. Now, climatologists thought that feedback response multiplied any direct warming by three or four. Now, a priori, one would not expect feedback response to have so very large an effect compared with the direct warming that caused it. And the reason for that is that the climate is what is called essentially thermostatic. Temperature does change, but it changes only within quite a narrow range. And therefore, one would expect feedback response to change the direct warming a little bit, but not to exceed the direct warming itself, and certainly not to exceed it by a factor of three or four. So a priori, then, one wouldn't expect the very large additional warming caused by feedback response that climatologists imagine. But let us first of all demonstrate the fact of the mistake they've made by stating it explicitly in a learned journal. And here, in a paper by Lasis et al. from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which has been a great champion of the cause of uh, very large global warming, here is what they said in 2010. They say non-condensing greenhouse gases, that's greenhouse gases other than water vapour, and they say those greenhouse gases, which account for 25% of the total terrestrial greenhouse effect, provide the stable temperature structure that sustains the current levels of atmospheric water vapour and clouds via feedback processes that account for the remaining 75% of the greenhouse effect. So what they're saying is direct warming of, shall we say, 1 Kelvin, which is roughly what you'd get per doubling of CO2, will become th four times that, because you have to add another three Kelvin to take account of feedback response. So there is an explicit statement, quantitative statement of the error. And what they're saying is that only a quarter of final warming comes from direct warming by greenhouse gases. All the rest comes from this amplifying feedback response. Now why then do we think this is an error? Before we look at that, let us consider the extent to which the error manifests itself in current predictions that are consistent with the error and are not consistent with the position once the error has been corrected. Well, the latest computer models of climate, that's the sixth generation of the a coupled model intercomparison project, they predict mid-range final warming that is almost four times the direct warming. Direct warming by doubled CO2 is only just over one degree, one Kelvin. However, currently predicted mid-range final warming by doubled CO2 is 3.9 Kelvin, which is almost four times greater than the direct warming. The difference between those two is feedback response. And so here we can see that in the latest generation of models, just taking the mid-range position, it's very clear that the modelers, like the rest of climatology on both sides of the debate, are expecting feedback response to multiply the direct warming by three. You add that on and you get roughly four times the direct warming as your final warming. And that is why it is imagined that there is a climate emergency, because if we were going to see four degrees of global warming in the rest of this century, rather than the one degree which you'd probably predict if you weren't going to 
over-exaggerate the influence of feedback, then four degrees might be a problem. And one degree certainly wouldn't be. It's just too little to do any harm. Indeed, it would probably do quite a lot of good. So the error does show up in current predictions. And the question therefore arises, why were climate scientists misled? How could they have got this so wrong? And indeed, you may be asking by this stage, did they get this so wrong? Well, let me first of all say that it is not considered by the group that the vast majority of climate scientists got this wrong deliberately. The group has assessed this question, it has consulted scientists on both sides, it has concluded that the error is an error that arose chiefly, not necessarily exclusively, but chiefly by inadvertence. Well, how then could just about everybody have made so large an error? Well, the reason turns out to be that climatologists, at a vital point in their calculations, decided they needed to borrow some mathematics and physics from a branch of physics that was not their own. And the mathematics and physics of feedback in dynamical systems, that is, systems which change their state over time, is known to engineering physicists as control theory. Without it, we couldn't have got to the moon. Control theory was first developed in the 1920s and 30s and 40s to stabilise long-distance telephone circuits, which were notorious for amplifying not only the signal, the voice, but also any crackles and distortions on the line, so that after two or three successive amplifications along uh, an intercontinental telephone line, all you would hear was static at the other end. And Harold S. Black at the Bell Labs, which were then in New York, was travelling one morning in 1926, in the spring, from the fine terminal at Hoboken in New Jersey to New York on the Lackawanna Ferry. And with him he had his newspaper, the New York Times, and he suddenly thought up the equations of feedback and jotted them down on that day's copy of the newspaper. And that was the moment at which control theory was founded. He then wrote a paper which was published in 1934 describing how a feedback amplifier works and then his colleague at Bell Labs, uh, Hendrik Wade Bode, produced what then became the standard textbook shortly after the end of the war in 1945 which was uh, talking about feedback amplification in dynamical systems. That textbook became a bestseller. It went through one or two editions every year for 30 years until the advent of digital circuitry meant that you didn't need to know so much about feedback in the analog circuits, which was why feedback had originally been developed. The feedback theory had been developed. And so the knowledge of feedback theory became rather specialist and confined to quite a small number of highly specialist physicists known as control theorists. And it is after detailed conversations both with control theorists and with climate scientists that the group has formed the view which is presented here. Now the traditional block diagram, as it's called, for a feedback amplifier, that is an amplifier that also has feedback in it, shows only one input, the base signal, that's at top left of the diagram. And you'll see that feeds in to an amplifier, the triangular symbol indicates an amplifier, the gain block, which is labelled G for gain. And there, 
that is amplified. So in the climate, the base signal is the emission temperature of about 255 Kelvin. It might be 10 or 15 Kelvin above or below that figure. It doesn't actually change the numbers very much as we see, but it's around 255. That's the value that climatologists largely agree on, and the group has decided that uh, we will not argue with that. So that's the base signal. So where then does the gain signal come in? Well, that's what the gain block does in the traditional uh, feedback amplifier block diagram. The gain block is a way of representing any additional signal over on top of the base signal. So then the output of the gain block goes round a loop, and you can see here it's drawn as a square, but it is a loop, and it goes through the feedback block, which is labelled H by uh, modern convention, and the feedback fraction is the fraction of the output signal which is represented by the feedback response, B. So as you go around, that feedback response gets fed back into the amplifier and then to the output, and it goes round and round and round an infinite number of times. And there is a very simple mathematical representation of how this operates. However, climate scientists didn't realize on looking at this diagram that there are in reality two inputs, not just the base signal, which is, as I say in the climate, emission temperature, but also the perturbation signal or gain signal, which in the climate is direct warming by the non-condensing greenhouse gases. And because you can only see one signal going in, what climatologists did was to forget the base signal altogether and feed in only the perturbation signal and amplify that and therefore attribute all the feedback response in the climate to that gain or perturbation signal from the greenhouse gases without realising that nearly all the feedback response that resulted didn't come from that perturbation signal, it came from the base signal. And the group has been very extensively through the uh, climate journals and has not been able to find to date a single paper that gets this right. All papers on climate sensitivity, even those which explicitly consider control theory and its application to the climate, perpetrate this same error. It is a universal error. Now, to make matters clearer, it is possible to simplify the feedback amplifier. And here the group is grateful to a team which has been working for some years on the problems posed by this error to climatology. And that group, which includes a tenured professor of control theory, has revised the traditional feedback amplifier formulism, which was reflected in the previous graph, to replace it with the block diagram you see on the right of this slide. And in this simplified block diagram, which looks superficially similar to its predecessor, you will see that there are two separate inputs, each clearly shown and each clearly separate from one another. The base signal, here labelled R for reference signal, and the gain signal, which is where the uh, global warming from greenhouse gases comes in, delta R, which means a change to the base signal. It is a warming. So the base signal, the 255 Kelvin emission temperature, then the gain signal, which is the additional direct warming before accounting for feedbacks from the greenhouse gases. Now those two are fed in, and you just follow the arrows in these diagrams, to the input-output node, which is summative, the symbol for for addition there in the middle of the circle shows that all the inputs to 
that input output node which is a summative node are simply added to one another and you can build an electronic circuit to do this and indeed one of the groups we consulted had actually gone to a national laboratory to get a circuit built so that they could test whether the analysis which is being presented here was a respectable analysis and whether the results were as that group had predicted and they found that they were. So the base signal and the gain signal are added together. They pass around to the feedback block where it is visible that they must both be amplified by the feedback block. There is no way that the climate feedback circuit can tell the difference between a Kelvin of temperature that is part of the base signal and a Kelvin of temperature that's part of the gain signal. They can't tell the difference between a Kelvin of sunshine and a Kelvin of extra warming from greenhouse gases. A Kelvin is a Kelvin is a Kelvin. A degree is a degree is a degree. And the feedback processes in the climate at any different moment, any particular moment, must respond to the entire signal that is received by the feedback block and not just to one arbitrarily selected part of that signal. Therefore, any feedback response, which is here labelled B, is a feedback response to not only the direct warming by greenhouse gases, that's the gain or perturbation signal delta R, but also to the 30 times larger sunshine temperature of 255 Kelvin that would obtain at or near the surface of the Earth even if there were no greenhouse gases in the air whatsoever at the outset. So redoing the feedback amplifier in this way enables everyone to see at once that there are two distinct inputs to the feedback loop via the summative input output node and that those two inputs are the base signal emission temperature and the perturbation signal which is the additional warming by first natural and then later anthropogenic greenhouse gases. So now having seen uh, the two different uh, designs for a feedback amplifier, let us combine uh, and compare, rather not combine, but compare the two feedback amplifiers. On the left, the original feedback amplifier circuit. Now there is nothing wrong with the diagram on the left. That you will find in textbooks of control theory uh, all the way since the 1940s. But what you won't find, but which is functionally identical, is the circuit on the right. For the same base signal and the same reference uh, and the same change, the perturbation to that signal, the, the, the gain signal, for those two values, then and for the same feedback fraction, the output will be identical whichever of these two circuits you use. But look how much clearer it is on the right hand simplified circuit that there are indeed two distinct inputs from outside that circuit. The base signal emission temperature and the gain signal which is the perturbation signal from the warming caused by greenhouse gases. Both of those signals are added together and therefore both are amplified by the feedback block. So there is a comparison of these two feedback amplifiers and it was because the feedback on the amplifier on the left does not show clearly that there are two separate inputs, each of which is amplified by the feedback block. That climatology thought that there was no base signal, there was only a perturbation signal going in. That was being amplified then uh, yet again by an additional and actually spurious amplification and that was how they ended up forecasting far too much global warming. So now that we've seen why it is that the error was made, 
The next question is to see how they manifested the error in their description, their definition of climate feedback. And here we go to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And that was founded in 1988 and has produced six assessment reports on the climate, each longer than the last. The latest one is 4,000 pages long, just the scientific section of it. And in these reports, feedback is mentioned many, many times. For instance, in the fifth assessment report published in 2013, the word feedback occurs well over 1,100 times in the text of the report. Because obviously, if, as climatology does, you think that feedback response is three times the direct warming that engendered it, then the main question you have to answer in trying to work out how much global warming will cause is how much is the impact of feedback? That's the big question. Naturally, therefore, it was necessary for climate science to define what it meant by climate feedback. And the IPCC, which presents itself as the authoritative voice of climate science, though it is in reality a political organisation, defines climate feedback as follows. It says it is an interaction in which a perturbation in one climate quantity causes a change in a second, and the change in the second quantity ultimately leads to an additional change in the first. A negative feedback is one in which the initial perturbation is weakened by the changes it causes. A positive feedback is one in which the initial perturbation is enhanced. Now that is not at all easy to follow. Indeed, we went to a professor of climatology who does also have a considerable knowledge of control theory. And we asked him to advise us on whether this was an adequate definition of climate feedback. And he responded that it was, in his single one blunt word, nonsense. And, of course, we can at once see from the previous discussion, looking at the circuit diagrams, that there is no mention in this definition anywhere of the fact that the biggest feedback response doesn't come from perturbations in global temperature, it comes from the original global temperature, which is the emission temperature that arises simply because the sun is shining, even if there are no greenhouse gases in the air at all at the outset. So this definition is defective in that it omits any mention of the large feedback response to the large emission temperature, and therefore by implication and by extension, it applies that large feedback response to and miscounts it as part of the actually very small feedback response to direct warming by greenhouse gases. So there we see a very clear misdefinition of climate feedback. So now let us try to offer a corrected definition. Again, we've consulted many climatologists and control theorists in order to make sure that the definition that we shall now present is, broadly speaking, a fair and accurate definition. And uh, let me just read it out. Temperature feedback modifies, it could change upwards or downwards, a reference temperature uh, and that is a direct warming, a reference temperature, which is the sum of the emission temperature and all subsequent perturbations, such as those caused by greenhouse gases. And how does this temperature feedback modify that temperature? Well, it triggers a feedback response. And a feedback response is an indirect temperature change consequent upon and proportional to reference temperature. And now you see, the moment we talk of reference temperature, we're talking of the whole temperature at the moment of interest. And that, of course, includes not only the small direct warming by greenhouse gases, but also the large direct warming by the fact that the sun is shining, the emission temperature 255 Kelvin. 
feedback response then is the difference between direct and final temperatures, the difference between reference and equilibrium temperatures. A positive feedback is one that amplifies that direct reference temperature and negative feedback will attenuate it, will reduce it. And here's an important consideration. At any moment, the aggregate feedbacks that are then present must necessarily respond equally to each degree of reference temperature and thus they must respond proportionately to each component in reference temperature. Now that may seem a bit baffling at this stage but uh, it will be explained as this presentation unfolds. So now that we've corrected the definition of feedback so that it will include not only the direct warming by greenhouse gases to which feedback response is a response, but also the direct warming by the sun, the emission temperature, to which a far larger feedback response is a response. We can turn to a fundamental principle of feedback, and one which is surprisingly little known. And we found even among control theorists, there was a certain amount of objection to this until it had been rather thoroughly explained. And this principle is the principle of proportionality in feedback response. And this means that at any given moment, and let us take as our example 1850, the climate feedback processes then present must respond equally to each degree of the reference temperature then obtaining and must therefore respond proportionately to each component in that reference temperature. Now, how does this work with actual figures? If we look at 1850, that's a good place to start. And the reason why is that the data that we have available to us for 1850 are relatively well constrained. In other words, there isn't too much uncertainty about them. We also know that at that stage, our influence on climate was far too small to have made any measurable, discernible difference, so that one can assume, without any great error arising, that all the warming that occurred up until 1850 was of natural rather than of anthropogenic origin. So we look then at the 1850 temperature and we were talking of the components in that temperature. So what are the components? Well, they are simply the, uh, and we're talking about the reference temperature here, uh, the temperature before we account for feedback. There are two components in that reference temperature. The first is the 255 Kelvin emission temperature and the second is the direct warming by the pre-industrial and therefore naturally occurring greenhouse gases, nothing to do with us. And these are, of course, the non-condensing greenhouse gases before we account for feedback. And the direct warming by the greenhouse gases up until 1850 works out at about 7.6 Kelvin. And the reason I take these values of 255 Kelvin and 7.6 Kelvin for the two components in the 262.6 Kelvin reference temperature before accounting for feedback up until 1850 is that those values are, broadly speaking, agreed in both sides of the climate literature. Neither of these values is objectionable or unreasonable. Now then what we have to do is to add the feedback response to each of these two components. And as you will see, the feedback responses shown in red below each of those two components are proportional to the size of those components. The bigger the direct warming, the bigger the feedback response, the smaller the smaller. And so the 255 Kelvin direct warming produced a, a feedback response of 24.2 Kelvin, quite a large feedback response. Whereas the direct greenhouse gas warming, because it's so small, only produced a small feedback response of just 0.7 Kelvin. Now think about that for a moment. It means that throughout the whole of history, until 1850, the entire 
feedback response attributable to greenhouse gases was only 0.7 Kelvin. It was less than three quarters of a degree. Now you add those two feedback responses together and you get the total feedback response in the climate in 1850, which is 24.9 Kelvin. And then uh, the bottom line of the table here is the final warming, the equilibrium temperature. And you'll see that uh, the emission temperature contributed more than 279 Kelvin to the 287.5 Kelvin uh, measured final temperature in 1850. Now, why do I say the temperature in 1850 was a final temperature? That it, well, there wasn't still some warming to come, sort of buried in the oceans. Well, the reason is that after 1850, according to the only temperature record that goes back that far, the Hadcrude 4 temperature record produced in the United Kingdom, there would be no global warming at all until 1930. So for the following 80 years, there was what's called a zero trend in global warming. And that means that without much error, we can treat the temperature as it stood in 1850, the 287.5 Kelvin temperature, as being an equilibrium or final temperature with respect to all of the influences on temperature up to that point. So there we can see just how very small is the feedback response to all the greenhouse gases that were already in the air before we made any significant difference there too. So now we're in a position to move on and try to ask in what fashion did the climate scientists get their sums wrong? Well, as we've seen, the essential er error that they made was to forget that the sun visibly shining in the sky was shining, that therefore the emission temperature that would prevail uh, near the Earth's surface in the absence of any greenhouse gases in the air at the outset uh, is temperature driven entirely by the sun and that therefore that temperature is itself capable of triggering a feedback response and that in 1850 it will therefore have contributed 29 thirtieths of the entire feedback response, which, however, climatology had inadvertently attributed entirely to the greenhouse gases. So that was the nature of the error. And now we can quantify its effect. And we'll do this line by line. You'll find that the red figures in the diagram are for the climatologist's erroneous way of handling feedback and we're again looking at the position in 1850 here and then in in bright blue there's the corrected position so now that we uh, have seen that let's go through this line by line first of all there's no particular argument as to the first line in purple there that's the global mean surface temperature in 1850 the direct warming or reference temperature was 262.6 kelvin Add to that 24.9 Kelvin in total feedback response and you get the final warming which is measured. We know this was the temperature at that time. It was 287.5 Kelvin. Now then uh, the global mean surface temperature is itself the sum of emission temperature and the warming in response to it. So uh, in response to greenhouse gases I should say. So the emission temperature, let's look at that line now, was 255 Kelvin. We've seen that figure before. Now, climatology in red there under feedback response, zero. They imagine there is no feedback response to emission temperature. And indeed, we went to one of the most eminent climatologists in the world. And we said, was there a feedback response to emission temperature? And he said, tentatively, I don't think there is. Well, we've now seen in looking at the circuit diagram why we, it is known that there is. And in, in control theory, there is absolutely no doubt about this. We have not found any control theorist who is willing to say there is no feedback response to emission temperature. But climatology's predictions are consistent with the absence 
of any feedback response to emission temperature and their definition of feedback temperature does not encompass any uh, reference to emission temperature or the feedback response there too. So they put it down as zero. And the corrected position is that the feedback response to emission temperature is 24.2 Kelvin. And so then you can add up the final warming in response to emission temperature before any of the non-condensing greenhouse gases are taken into account. It's only a little, little over 8 Kelvin short of the temperature in 1850. So then to the emission temperature, you add the direct warming by pre-industrial non-condensing greenhouse gases, that's 7.6 Kelvin there in green. And once again, you see an enormous discrepancy between how climatology handles this and how control theory handles it. The climatologists say that the entire feedback response up to 1850 is attributable to the 7.6 Kelvin of greenhouse gas direct warming and therefore all 24.9 Kelvin belongs to and is triggered by and is proportional to that. Whereas, of course, uh, if we do this correctly, only 0.7 Kelvin is the feedback response to the 7.6 Kelvin because all of the rest is feedback response to the emission temperature on the line above. So then, what does this mean for the final or equilibrium warming by double CO2 in the air? Well, as you can see, if a direct warming of 7.6 Kelvin produces only 0.7 Kelvin of additional feedback response, then we're not expecting to see 3 Kelvin of feedback response for every 1 Kelvin of direct warming. We would only expect to see actually less than 0.1 Kelvin per 1 Kelvin of direct warming. So that the final warming is 1 Kelvin plus 0.1 Kelvin of feedback uh, response, total 1.1. Kelvin. And whereas climatology says it's one Kelvin of direct warming by double CO2 plus three Kelvin in feedback response, total four Kelvin of final warming. So you can see that climatology's three Kelvin of feedback response per doubling of CO2 is 30 times too large. That is the magnitude of the error. And of course, in terms of final warming, the equilibrium sensitivity, it means that the final warming is about four times too large. So it is a substantial error. And there you can just see all the different numbers that show the differences between the two approaches and how it was that climatology's misunderstanding of the way feedback works misled it into making this very large mistake. So now we look at the data uncertainties as they applied to 1850. Because what bedevils all of climatology, and this is not in any sense climatologists' fault, is that it's very difficult to get accurate measurements of anything. For instance, if I were to give you a piece of string and I said to you, how long is that piece of string? It's a famous question in science. But you would measure it, and you might measure it with a yardstick, you might measure it against your own height, you might measure it in various ways, you might measure it several times with the same yardstick, and each time come up with slightly different answers. And that's because the string is slightly elastic, the yardstick might be a different length depending on the ambient temperature, all manner of reasons why you can't ever say we know exactly the length of a particular piece of string. So there are therefore uncertainties in every measurement that is made throughout the sciences. And in this respect, climate science is no different. And these uncertainties have to be constrained. We have to find ways of handling the data so that the fact that there are wide uncertainties in the data does not mislead us into making some wrong conclusions. So what we're going to do is look at the data uncertainties in the temperature data for 1850. And here we start actually at the bottom of the graph with the four sources of data. We have the direct warming by doubled CO2. And 
Broadly speaking, according to the current estimates in climatology, the direct warming or reference sensitivity to doubled CO2 is just 1.06 Kelvin. It's a little bit above 1 Kelvin. And the scientific papers on this show there's an uncertainty of probably 0.1 Kelvin up or down. Now here, as elsewhere throughout this presentation, the group has decided to adopt the position of accepting as true, for the sake of argument only, everything in official climatology except what is demonstrably and here demonstrated to be false. Therefore, although uh, the group suspects very much that there is much more uncertainty as to the direct warming by doubled CO2, as climatology's figures suggest, here the group will be using climatology's figures. And climatology would not query those figures very much. The emission temperature we've talked of before, 255 Kelvin. Here there is uh, quite a large absolute uncertainty, though a fairly small percentage one, because we simply aren't able to take all the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and measure what the emission temperature is. So there's a little uncertainty there, about 15 Kelvin either side. Then the direct warming by pre-industrial non-condensing greenhouse gases, well, again, climatology doesn't think there's very much uncertainty about that, so we've taken something like the uncertainty that they rely upon of just one Kelvin either side of the 7.6 Kelvin, which is the mid-range estimate you can derive from the formulae that they themselves present. And then there's the total feedback response up to 1850, well, that's a relatively straightforward matter. It's simply the difference between the reference temperature of 255 plus 7.6 equals 262.6 Kelvin and the 287.5 Kelvin measured global temperature in 1850. So it's 24.9 Kelvin, but of course an uncertainty arises because we don't know the value of emission temperature. So that's going to be plus or minus 16 Kelvin. And so those are the values that are then fed in to the equations. First of all, using the erroneous method of the IPCC, where you can see that the data uncertainties give you quite considerable variations in the amount of warming you would expect, the final warming, in response to doubled CO2. And you'll see that uh, the IPCC would have as the best estimate on this basis 4.5 Kelvin uh, with a range of 2.4 to 6.9 Kelvin. That's if you do it on the basis of their error. Now IPCC in fact uses slightly lower figures than these. It says 3, 3 Kelvin is the mid-range estimate and that would be between 1.5 and, and 4.5 Kelvin. Though in fact, as we've seen earlier, the models from the sixth generation of the coupled modeling to comparison project find that the mid-range estimate is actually 3.9 Kelvin, which is quite close to the 4.5 shown here on the basis of the way climatology makes its mistake. But look what happens if we use the corrected method. First of all, the global warming is a lot less. Secondly, it's a lot better constrained, even though the figures we're using to calculate it have quite large variances in them. And that's shown in that right-hand column there, where we have a, a best estimate of 1.16 Kelvin of warming per doubled CO2, and that ranges between 1.12 and 1.2 Kelvin. So that just shows that even with data uncertainties, provided you use the correct feedback mathematics, as we have done on the right there, where you can see that the feedback, uh, the, the emission temperature is explicitly taken into account 255 plus or minus 15 Kelvin in the calculation, that calms the whole thing down and you get a much smaller variance and you get a much smaller warming. So how large then is climatology's error? Well here we can look at a concept known as the system gain factor. 
and that is the final warming divided by the direct warming. And it's a measure of how big an impact feedbacks have, how much do they multiply the direct warming by. And you'll see if you do it climatologist way, you simply take the entire 32.5 Kelvin natural greenhouse effect. That's the difference between emission temperature and the measured temperature in 1850. It's 32.5 Kelvin. You divide it by 8.5 Kelvin of direct warming and you get about a factor of 4. So if you've got 1 Kelvin of direct warming by double CO2, it becomes roughly 4 Kelvin. And sure enough, that is what the models predict. And the same thing, but corrected, gives you a very different answer. And what have we done? Well, if you're working out the system gain factor, you just put the 255 Kelvin emission temperature that's missing from climatology's calculation at the top and bottom of exactly the same fraction. So instead of 32.5 over 8.5, it becomes 255 plus 32.5 over 255 plus 8.5, and suddenly you've got an answer which is less than 1.1. So if you're multiplying 1 Kelvin of direct warming by double CO2 by the system gain factor 1.1, you end up with 1.1 Kelvin of global warming. So you can see that doing it the wrong way multiplies the global warming you would, lead, you would be led to expect by almost 4. So it is a big error. Well, now it's time just to look very briefly at observed global warming. And here it is, the observed warming over the 76 years since the end of the Second World War in July 1945 is equivalent to just over 1.1 Kelvin or Celsius per century. 1.1, exactly as one would expect once one corrects climatology's error. So, global warming in the 21st century then will be approximately 1.1 Kelvin and not the 4 Kelvin currently imagined by climatology. And why is this? Well, the reason is that final warming this century will be similar to the final warming in response to double CO2 in the air. Of course, the final warming we cause comes from a lot of other things than CO2, but it happens that what's called the radiative forcing that is expected this century uh, from all the anthropogenic influences on climate and all the different greenhouse gases we might influence is broadly speaking equal to the radiative forcing from doubling CO2 in the air. So the two numbers will be about the same. So after we correct climatology's grave error, we wouldn't expect to see four Kelvin, four degrees of global warming this century. We'd expect to see only 1.1, which is far less uh, to worry about. So sure enough, warming since 1945, as we've seen, has been equivalent to 1.1 Kelvin per century. And after correcting climatology's error, one would not expect that underlying rate of warming to be very different in the remaining part of the 21st century. And indeed, in the last seven years and four months, as of the time of recording this presentation, there has been no global warming at all. According to the Hadcrete 4 data set, which is still the current data set uh, produced in Britain, there has been no trend whatsoever for seven years and four months. So then global warming in the 21st century, uh, as we've seen, will be 1.1 Kelvin. So that remains now just to ask a question that climatologists so far cannot answer. In all the evolution of climate over millions of years up until 1850, direct warming by the naturally occurring non-condensing greenhouse gases such as CO2 was 7.6 degrees. And we know that this 7.6 degrees drove only 0.7 degrees of feedback response. That's 0.1 degrees of feedback response per degree of direct warming that triggered that feedback response. So here's the question. How can one degree of warming since 
1850, cause about three degrees of feedback response, because that works out not at 0.1 degrees per degree of unit feedback response, it works out at three degrees per degree, which as we've seen before, is 30 times too big. So there's the question. How can it be that with only 0.7 degrees of feedback response to all the greenhouse gases that were in the air up to 1850 and have been there for billions of years, how do we suddenly go in just 170 years to expecting to see three degrees of feedback response per one degree of direct warming by greenhouse gases? It is not very plausible that so very large a change could happen given that temperature today is only about one degree or 0.3% in absolute terms greater than it was in 1850. And finally then, what would be the effect on global temperature of pursuing the policy which the uh, climate alarmists have been clamouring for, which is that Western countries and Western countries only should shut down their economies to the point of not emitting, in net terms, any CO2 at all by 2050. That is the policy of the rather excitable British government on this topic. And it is also a policy being pushed by the European Union, and by others, uh, of course, none of the non-Western countries are going to do this. China has said very clearly that it's not. India likewise, and between them they account for about half of all global emissions. And in any case, the Paris Climate Accords apply only to the Western countries. <coughs> and the Western countries between them only account for about 20% of all new emissions. All the rest of those emissions are in countries that are exempt from re making any reductions in emissions under the Paris Accords and which are making it quite clear that they're not going to reduce their emissions. So with that background then, let's look at just how much global warming might be averted by first global, then Western and then United Kingdom net zero emissions in 2050. And here it's going to be assumed that there's a straight line decline from the emissions that each country makes at the moment to net zero in 2050. And we're going to do this on two bases. One, that the IPCC's data are correct. And two, on the basis that the IPCC has made an error, the same error of physics that the rest of climatology has, and therefore we correct that to see what difference it makes to the numbers. So first of all, we need some raw data, and these are very simple. First of all, the annual growth in anthropogenic radiative forcing from all greenhouse gases. And that we get from the annual greenhouse gas index produced by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. And it works out at 0.036 watts per square metre per year. And that's been the case for 40 years in more or less a straight line. For all the ups and downs and all the changes in policy, the amount of increase in the anthropogenic forcing each year is more or less exactly the same at 0.036 watts per square meter per year that even applied in the year of the pandemic when there was a great deal less emission of greenhouse gases by us nevertheless the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, continued to rise at exactly the same rate as it had before now then we want to look therefore at what 30 years of anthropogenic forcing growth would amount to, that's between 2021 and 2050, 30 years, well that would be 1.08 watts per square metre. But if we reduce that down to net zero by 2050, we have to halve that because the amount of forcing that would otherwise have occurred, which will be forestalled by going in a straight line from where we are now to net zero, would be half of what would otherwise be the total emissions. And so that's 0.54 watts per square metre. Now of that, the United Kingdom's contribution is 
percent. Then we have to work out a slightly complicated number called the equilibrium sensitivity parameter. And this is where the numbers begin to divide between the IPCC's way of doing things and the corrected way of doing things. The equilibrium sensitivity parameter is the amount by which you measure, you, you multiply the direct warming by doubled CO2 or by any other warming in order to get the final warming after you allow for feedback. So direct warming before feedback multiplied by the equilibrium sensitive per parameter gives you the final warming after feedback. <coughs> so let us have a look. Global warming abated by global net zero emissions over those 30 years <coughs> would be 0.54 times, that's the forcing, multiplied by the uh, equilibrium sensitive parameters. The red one, 0.76, is the IPCC's version, and 0.31 is the corrected version. So the global warming abated if the whole world went in a straight line uh, to net zero emissions by 2050, which we know it's not going to. But even if it did, and even if the IPCC were right and there'd be no mistake in climatology, the amount of warming that would otherwise have occurred that will be forestalled by 2050 is only two-fifths of a Celsius degree. And imagine how many hundreds of trillions it would cost to achieve, in effect, nothing. And if the IPCC as wrong as the group considers it to be, then you're only going to see an abatement of 1.6, sorry, one-sixth of a Kelvin over the whole 30 years, even tinier. But now let's look at just the Western net zero emissions. Because the emissions globally, we account now for only 20% of new emissions. And so that means that even if the Western countries complied with net zero and the rest of the world didn't because it doesn't have to and it feels itself under no obligation to do so, then the amount of warming forestalled of the IPCC is right is one twelfth of a Celsius degree or Kelvin. And if the group's correction to official climatology is right, then it's one thirtieth of a Kelvin would be forestalled, even if the West all went net zero. And then for illustration, we have looked at the position in the United Kingdom, which was the first country to make the commitment to go to net zero because it has a functionally, scientifically illiterate cabinet. They, they, they simply do not have the ability to understand, still less to compile, an assessment such as that which is being presented to you now. And it's only 1.2 percent of the global warming that would be forestalled if the whole world went that way. So we're looking at one two hundredth of a Kelvin by 2050 if the nation extinguished all its CO2 emissions by that date. If the IPCC's methodology is correct, but if the corrected methodology is correct, as the group thinks it is, then that comes down to one five hundredth of a Kelvin. And what would that cost? Well, Her Majesty's Treasury has for two years consistently refused, as has the Climate Change Committee, a theoretically independent but actually highly party pre group of profiteers from wind farms and other such devices. And they have refused for two years to produce proper benefit cost analyses of just how much it would cost and just how little benefit would be received if one went to net zero. And that's one of the reasons why the group has added on uh, this calculation to the presentation so that it can be seen just how little the United Kingdom would achieve if it went net zero. It would reduce temperature by somewhere between one two hundredth and one five hundredth of a Celsius degree. An entirely negligible amount. And the Treasury says that the overall cost is only going to be 1.275 trillion. But the National Grid Authority, which runs the electricity grid, has done its own calculations 
and it's done them on several different bases and the answers come out much the same either way. It says three trillion sterling, which is about four trillion dollars to achieve one two hundredth to one five hundredth of a Kelvin of temperature reduction over that period. So from that one can see that even if IPCC's methodology and that of climatology generally were correct, the amount of warming one would forestall is so small that the costs of forestalling it outweigh many times over the putative benefits from that reduction. It really isn't worth doing anything about global warming at all. And with that, we summarise this brief presentation with the conclusions that have been reached by the group during its researches. First, climate scientists borrowed the mathematics of feedback from control theory, a branch of engineering physics with which they were insufficiently familiar and which they gravely misunderstood. They did not understand what they had borrowed. Therefore, they made the error of neglecting the base signal in their circuit diagrams and in their calculations. The base signal, which is the 255 Kelvin of emission temperature that would prevail on Earth even if there were no greenhouse gases in the air at the outset. And it would prevail simply because, like it or not, the sun is shining. They forgot the sun was shining. So they added the feedback response to emission temperature, the feedback response to the sun's warmth, to the feedback response to greenhouse gas warming, and they counted the feedback response to the sun as though it were part of the feedback response to the greenhouse gases, and that greatly increased the amount of warming they expected and still expect to see from the greenhouse gases. Now, you may think this error is so elementary, on its face at any rate, that surely it would have been discovered long before now. The answer to that is unfortunately no, because of the growing curse of interdisciplinary specialisation and compartmentalisation. Each science now goes into a narrower and narrower field in a smaller and smaller pigeonhole and the scientist in that pigeonhole can't see over the wall of the pigeonhole to the next pigeonhole to see what the other scientists are doing. This is a very big and growing problem in science. The days when a reasonably well-read general scientist could have a good grasp of all the relevant fields of science just for this climate debate, um, that, that probably stopped about... 200 years ago. Specialisation ever since then has grown apace for understandable reasons. But it does mean that if scientists in one pigeonhole borrow science from another pigeonhole where they've never been before, it's very easy to get it wrong. And that's what's happened here. So what one must say is that there should be no crowing because climate scientists made such a catastrophic mistake. They did, very nearly all of them, make this mistake quite genuinely and on both sides of the debate. And until a small group came along and spent some years sorting this out, there was really no way that anyone could see that so large a mistake had been made. But it has. And the control theorists that we have consulted have almost without exception agreed that a mistake has been made as described in this presentation. So therefore, the model's predictions, we then checked to see whether they were consistent with climate scientists' error and inconsistent with the corrective position. And sure enough, they are more or less exactly consistent with climate scientists' error and therefore inferentially influenced by it. Why do I say infer inferentially rather than Definitely. The reason for that is that the models do not incorporate feedback processes within themselves directly. Feedbacks are an emergent property from the runs of the models and not something that the models calculate directly. 
But we can use control theory as an independent yardstick with which to measure the outputs of the models without actually knowing how the models themselves work. We do know how the models work, but that's not the point. We don't need to know the internals of the models. All we need to know is that control theory does put a pretty firm constraint upon how much global warming we might expect. And all the predictions of the models, including the low end predictions, are well above the mid-range value that would be expected after correction of climatology's error. And therefore, just as warming since 1945 has occurred at 1.1 degrees per century equivalent, so after correcting the error, one would only expect 1.1 Kelvin of warming to occur this century. In other words, that the pre-existing rate of trend in global warming is likely, all other things being equal, to continue as it is even if no attempts are made whatsoever to abate global warming by punishing the West selectively for its alleged past sins of emission. So after correcting the error, only a small amount of warming will be expected. So global warming will be small, slow, harmless and net beneficial. Now that may sound very strange given the voices of doom, which are of course based on the mistake identified here. However, it is becoming evident that crop yields are rising to new record highs. Of course, that is partly attributable to chemical fertilization, but it is also attributable to CO2 fertilization, which is the primary, indeed the near exclusive reason why the net primary productivity of flora, that's the total green biomass of trees and plants on Earth, has increased by between 15 and 30 percent, according to NASA satellites, over the past three or four decades. Why? Because CO2 is plant food. The more of it we give them, the more they like it, the faster and more luxuriantly they grow. The crop yields are just one measure of that. Satellite images of uh, greening forests and greening pampas everywhere is another. Even in the Sahara, thanks to the warmer and therefore moister air, there's now large areas turning green that haven't had human habitation in living memory. Indeed, 300,000 square kilometres as early as by 1981 had been recorded as having uh, gone from desert to greenery because of global warming, which isn't therefore the uniformly bad thing that it has been presented to be. And global net zero emissions, even if we were to interfere so drastically with the economies of the West, to the great detriment of the West in terms of trade, that would stop just somewhere between one-sixth and two-fifths of a degree of warming over the whole of the next 30 years. And that's if the whole world did it. And it would only between be one-twelfth to one-thirtieth of uh, a degree forestalled if it was only the West, which is what at the moment the Paris Treaty insists upon, that was to aim for net zero emissions. So even if there were as much of a global warming problem as has been incorrectly and erroneously imagined on the basis of climatology's grave but elementary error, it really wouldn't be, economically speaking, worth doing anything whatsoever to stop it. That then concludes the Strategic Threat Assessment Group's presentation. And the group has concluded, and has concluded firmly, subject always to discussion with any who would wish to query the present uh, report, that global warming is not a strategic threat. Indeed, it will almost certainly prove to be beneficial, not only to humankind, but also to all other plant and animal species on Earth. Because in general, 
warmer weather is better for mankind than colder. The EU Commission did a survey on this only three years ago and they concluded that even if there were as much as 5.4 Celsius degrees of warming between now and 2080, a rate of warming of one Celsius degree per decade, ten times that which has been actually observed since 1945. Even if that very drastic rate of warming which would were to occur, which on the basis of this assessment it will not, even if it would, then there will be 93,000 more Europeans alive by 2050 than there would be if we carried on letting temperature increase. And the reason for that is that if you allow warming to happen, then far fewer people die of cold than die because the weather has got a bit warmer. And uh, one should not think that this applies only in Europe. A recent survey has demonstrated that in each region of the world the same thing applies. The warmer the weather, the fewer people die because far more people would otherwise have died of cold than will die of the warmer weather. So climate alarmism, on the other hand, is a real strategic threat. It is noticeable in all the documents of the UN's Climate Panel and of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change that all of the policies to damage the economies of member states in the name of extinguishing a warming, nearly all of which won't happen, and the bit that will happen will be net beneficial, is directed selectively at the Western world. The West, therefore, will suffer not only a considerable disadvantage in terms of trade by going net zero when the rest of the world has declared very plainly that it is not going to do the same, but it would also put itself at strategic risk because communist China, which under its current leadership has shown itself to be profoundly inimical to the freedoms and democracies that the West advocates and practices. You only have to look at the continued unlawful occupation of Tibet by China, the continued unlawful imprisonment in concentration camps of up to three million Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang province, next door to Tibet, but also the Belt and Road Initiative, the Wolf Warrior diplomacy, as China herself calls it, by which nations throughout the world, including several Western nations, have enslaved themselves to China by borrowing money from it, money that it simply prints and doesn't have to account for, but it acquires in printing that money a real obligation uh, on the part of Western and African and Asian countries to repay to China the largely fictitious money that it has lent to them. For all these reasons, if China continues, it now already, thanks to its occupation of Tibet, it already has something like 70% of the world's supplies of strategic um, rare earth metals such as lithium, cobalt, and also uh, metals such as copper, which are central to the widespread electrification of locomotion, cars, trains, and eventually perhaps even smaller planes over shorter distances. Now the problem with the enormous demand for lithium carbonate in particular, which is essential to just about all the current batteries, is that China is already in bed with the Taliban in Afghanistan, where just before uh, Mr. Biden favoured the enemies of the West by pulling precipitately out, very large deposits of lithium were found in Afghanistan. China is also quietly buying uh, at first placeholder and gradually controlling stakes in the remaining 30% of the world's lithium, such as, as a 9% stake that it holds in Greenland minerals, where recently a large find of lithium was found in southern Greenland. <coughs> 
And by going for net zero, by putting all our eggs in the basket of electric batteries, we're in danger of creating a basket case by which once we have done away with the internal combustion engine by 2030 in some countries, then it will be cripplingly expensive to go back to that and we will be permanently and heavily in hock to China, which by then will just be about uh, will be just about the only place from which lithium will be obtainable at all. There then is just one of the many strategic considerations, which however are only ancillary to the main purpose of this presentation, which was to demonstrate that there is, after all, no need to worry about global warming at all. It will be net beneficial and it is climate alarmism and the uh, economically suicidal policies that the more feeble-minded Western governments are adopting that is the real strategic threat. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening and thank you for thinking. For what is needed now is less shrieking, less apocalypticism and more rational scientific thought.